Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about chapter 13 of the A-level bio syllabus, which is all about photosynthesis. I'm going to simplify this chapter as much as possible. I'll include all the points in the syllabus and uh, the marking scheme here is that you should include to make your answers valid. Let's get started. First, as always, we have to look at the syllabus to find out what exactly we need to know to get as much marks as possible in our A-level bio exam. So first, we have to talk about the chloroplast, its structures, and how these structures uh, relate to the function of the chloroplast. Um, then we'll talk about photosynthesis uh, and its two stages, light-dependent reaction, which is the one that requires light, and light-independent, which does not require light. Um, and all the processes in both of these reactions. Then we'll talk about the absorption and the action spectra, which are both graphs that you must know. And then we'll talk about chromatography and how we can identify different pigments from chromatography. And then we'll talk about factors affecting photosynthesis, uh, redox indicator investigations, and other investigations that you need to know. So here is an overview of the structure of the chloroplast on the inside. We have the envelope, which is discussed in chapter one, which is basically when it has two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. In between them is the intermembrane space. Inside this, the chloroplast is a fluid called the stroma. The stroma contains DNA and 70S ribosomes which contribute to protein synthesis and produce enzymes and proteins required by the chloroplast for photosynthesis. And these enzymes and proteins are also contained inside the stroma. Also in the stroma is, um, are thylakoids. Thylakoids are fluid-filled sacs. When stacked on top of each other, it's called a granum. granum. And then the plural of granum is grana, so these are all grana. And then connecting those grana or thylakoids are stroma lamella. Now, we also took in like fourth grade or fifth grade that what gives the chloroplast its pigment is chlorophyll. Now, where is the chlorophyll located in this chloroplast? So, in the membrane of the thylakoid, we have things called photosystems and we'll discuss them in the next slides. These photosystems are basically made of um, different pigments that absorb light uh, called photosynthetic pigments like chlorophyll. Inside the thylakoid is thylakoid space. So outside it is stroma, inside is thylakoid space. Photosystems which are in thylakoid membranes are clusters of light harvesting pigments surrounding a reaction center. Light harvesting pigments is basically a fancy term for um, photosynthetic pigments like chlorophylls which absorb light energy. So a photosystem looks something like this. This is the thylakoid membrane and outside is the stroma and inside is the thylakoid space or lumen. This is a photosystem right here and we have two of them, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. These two are involved in the light dependent reaction or light dependent stage of photosynthesis and that's why when we talk about the location of light dependent reaction we say it is in the thylakoid membrane because photosystems are here. Now what Photosystems are made of is basically accessory pigments right here and primary pigments here. So primary pigments, the only primary pigment that we are supposed to know, I don't even know if there are more, is chlorophyll A. And accessory pigments include chlorophyll B. There are also other accessory pigments that you can find out more about in the textbook. So primary pigments are in a location in the photosystem called the reaction center. This is the reaction center. The reaction center contains electrons and primary pigments 
and we need to know chlorophyll. There are two chlorophylls per reaction center. What happens here is when light is hits this photosystem, it gets absorbed. Light energy gets absorbed by the accessory pigments and it gets funneled down or passed down to primary pigments or the reaction center where it excites the electron. So the electron becomes at a higher energy level and when it does, the chlorophyll here, chlorophyll A, emits that electron when it gets too excited. This is called photoactivation, where the chlorophyll emits the electron. Photoexcitation is when the electron gets excited and becomes at a higher energy level because of light being absorbed by the electron. You must know how to describe the structure of a chloroplast. Here are some points that you may want to write in your exam. So chloroplasts are biconvex, so like this. This is what a biconcave shape is, like a red blood cell. It's biconvex. It has a 3 to 10 micrometer in diameter. We already know this from chapter 1. It has an envelope. It has thylakoids. It has grana. It has a thylakoid membrane that contains ATP synthase which we'll discuss more about later. It has lamellae, which is the plural of lamella. It has stroma, has starch grains and lipids inside here, inside the stroma. Uh, and then stroma contains DNA and ribosomes, and DNA and ribosomes are used um, for protein synthesis and contains Calvin cycle enzymes, basically enzymes used for photosynthesis. Okay, so every single structure in the chloroplast plays a very important role in how the chloroplast functions. Let's take a look at how that happens. So the stroma here has two functions. Uh, the first and foremost is it is the site of light independent reaction or Calvin cycle. Uh, stroma also has enzymes, RUBP and reduced NADP. We'll discuss that later. But basically it has the enzymes and other uh, substances used in photosynthesis. Uh, thylakoids and grana are for the light dependent reaction as we just said or the location of photophosphorylation we will discuss that later thylakoid membranes have photosystems and pigments um, uh, the thylakoid membrane and the grana have high surface area for more light absorption DNA and ribosome uh, they are used for making photosynthetic proteins uh, so you know transcription and translation, basically protein synthesis, um, and then starch grains store chemical energy or products of photosynthesis. Okay, so photosynthesis basically um, consists of two main stages, light dependent stage, which is the one that requires sunlight, and light independent stage, which is the one that functions uh, with the products of the light dependent reaction. So basically, light-dependent reaction is here to make products for the light-independent reaction. So it requires sunlight and produces ADB and reduced NADP for light-independent reaction or the Calvin cycle. Uh, NADP is very, very similar to NAD that is used in respiration. So if you don't know what that is, it's basically a coenzyme that just basically carries hydrogen and, uh, you know, loses it in locations where hydrogen is needed. Uh, so it gets reduced and oxidized, or reoxidized and re-reduced. Reoxid, what? <laughs> Anyways, so the light-dependent reaction, in the light-dependent reaction, there are three processes that are taking place at all time. There is cyclic photophosphorylation, non-cyclic photophosphorylation, and photolysis. And we will take a deeper look at what these three processes are uh, but basically, as I just said, the main purpose of all of this is to produce NADP and reduced NAD, what? to produce ATP and reduced NADP for light independent reaction. Let's take a closer look at first the cyclic photophosphorylation, which is one of the three processes that takes place in light dependent reaction. Uh, cyclic photophosphorylation produces only ATP, and this ATP is used in the Calvin cycle, or basically light-independent reaction. 
So I wanted to ignore this very big description right now. I wanted to focus on this very simple diagram. This is photosystem one. Um, and cyclic photophosphorylation only takes place in photosystem one, which is something that is very important and you must remember because you might be asked about it. And it is an extra point in the marking scheme if you are asked to describe the cyclic photophosphorylation. So if we take a closer look at how a photosystem looks like, say for example, this is photosystem one, um, what happens is light is absorbed by the accessory pigments like chlorophyll B. Um, and this light energy that is absorbed, it is light energy, you must say that is that it is energy, is passed down or funneled to the reaction center uh, or to primary pigments or to chlorophyll A. Inside the reaction center, there are electrons. And when this energy gets funneled down to the reaction center, the electrons get excited, or basically they gain more energy. They become at a higher energy level. Okay. And when this happens, the electron is emitted from the chlorophyll A. So gets emitted, which is photoactivation. The chlorophyll gets activated and it emits that high energy electron. That electron that is emitted from the chlorophyll is accepted by an electron acceptor and then passed down to the electron transport chain. Um, we discussed what that is, or you have basically learned about it in respiration, so I'll only brush up on it. Uh, so what happens is ATP is produced uh, in the electron transport chain. We'll talk about it in the next slide. So passed along the electron transport chain, and then ATP is produced by chemiosmosis, like in respiration. And then this electron is returned to the chlorophyll. After it passes through the electron transport chain, the, elect the electron loses its energy to create ATP. And when it loses its energy, it returns back to the reaction center in photosystem one. And this entire thing repeats, and that is why it is called cyclic. So here is the thylakoid, and this is the thylakoid membrane. And then outside there is the stroma, and inside is the thylakoid space. This entire thing is a grana. Now in the thylakoid membrane, there are uh, photosystems. So photosystem one, there is also photosystem two, and there is the electron transport chain, and there is a proton pump, and there is also ATP uh, synthase. So as the electron is emitted from photosystem one, it gets accepted by an electron acceptor in the membrane. This electron acceptor will pass it down through the electron transport chain. As the electron passes down the electron transport chain, it emits energy. After it emits energy, um, the electron returns back to photosystem one with its low energy to get more energy so that the cycle can continue. But what happens to this energy that is emitted from the electron, it is used by the proton pump to pump protons against their concentration gradient by active transport from the stroma into the thylakoid space. So the energy is used by the proton pump. Proton is pumped, protons are pumped from the stroma into the thylakoid space against their gradient by active transport then the, there is a proton gradient that is produced between the stroma and the thylakoid space. So this becomes highly concentrated with protons. So protons then diffuse from high concentration to low concentration through ATP synthase. ATP synthase will produce ATP from ADP. And this ATP is then you know, it passes down through this ATP synthase into the stroma, basically. So now the stroma has ATP, and it can be used in the Calvin cycle.
Let's take a look at the second process that takes place in the light dependent reaction or light dependent stage, which is photolysis. So photolysis is basically using light energy to split water into three products. And these three products are oxygen, electrons, and protons. This is not a balanced equation, but you can balance it. So here, oxygen is a waste product, actually, because oxygen is not going to be used in photosynthesis. It's not going to be used in any other process that is upcoming in the chloroplast. But this oxygen can be used in the mitochondria of the cell. So the cell can produce oxygen from its chloroplasts and then use that oxygen produced um, in its mitochondria in, in, aerobic, in aerobic respiration, I mean. Um, but usually also oxygen diffuses out of the stomata of the leaves. And then we breathe in the oxygen. So uh, we're going to talk about why these are actually produced. They are used in non-cyclic uh, photophosphorylation. We'll talk about it in a second. So now we know so far why in photosynthesis light energy is used, water is used. Now we're going to also find out why carbon dioxide is produced in the Calvin cycle later on. But water here is split to these products. Oxygen is not used. Electrons and protons are used in non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Finally, the third process that takes place in light-dependent reaction, light -dependent reaction is non-cyclic photophosphorylation. This type of photophosphorylation produces two things, ATP and reduced NADP. Reduced NADP is required in the Calvin cycle or in the light independent reaction or stage. So let's take a closer look at how this takes place. So first you might notice that this photophosphorylation requires two photosystems, photosystem two and photosystem one. Now, what happens here is both of them, of course, have electrons in their reaction centers. But this electron in photosystem 2 is from the water that we split in photo photolysis. So water is split. And then the electrons here in this reaction system is from water. This is why it's called non-cyclic, because here we don't keep recycling electrons uh, like we do in cyclic photophosphorylation. The electrons here are from photosystem, I mean, the electrons here in photosystem 2 are from water splitting. After water is split, the electrons go to the reaction center of photosystem 2. Light energy, again, hits the photosystem. Accessory pigments absorb light energy. Light energy is passed down to the reaction center. The chlorophyll activates and emits that electron when it gains energy and becomes at a higher energy level. So the electron is emitted and then it is accepted by an electron acceptor. The electron acceptor passes it down through the electron transport chain. And as we talked about it before, uh, the electron transport chain produces ATP from ADP using the energy that is emitted by the electron as it passes through the electron transport chain. But now what is different is that the electron that is emitted from photosystem 2 is accepted by the reaction center of photosystem 1. So now we know that the electrons from photosystem 2 are from water. The electrons in photosystem 1 are from Photosystem 2. The same thing happens here. Light energy is absorbed. The electron gets excited, becomes at a higher energy level, it gets emitted, gets accepted by an electron transport chain. But this time, the energy emitted as the electron passes through the electron transport chain is used to reduce NADP to reduced NADP which is NADPH, by the way. As this happens, it just does not happen on its own, just does not happen with uh, you know, energy that gets emitted. 
uh, the electron here combines with NADP and also combines with the proton here to create NADPH, reduced NADP. So let me repeat, what you need for NADP to become NADPH is three things, an electron, a proton, so that it becomes neutral and not negatively charged, and we need the energy emitted by the electron that went through this electron transport chain that got emitted from photosystem one. You need to, if you don't really get it, you should repeat this video or this slide multiple times, but it gets easier the more you practice it. But it really is easy, trust me. So now we know how NADPH is produced or reduced NADP, how ATP is produced, and now we can move on to light independent reaction where these two products are used to finally produce glucose. So we discussed how um, light energy is taken in, how water is taken in, how oxygen is produced. Now we'll discuss how glucose is produced and how carbon dioxide is used up. So in light independent reaction, you don't really use light energy like you do in light dependent reaction but you do need the products of light dependent reaction which are ATP and NADPH. So this reaction produces glucose and other carbohydrates and also amino acids and lipids out of photosynthesis and these are used by the plant to basically function. Uh, that's why we call plants autotrophic because they create their own food by the process of photosynthesis. Other organisms are heterotrophic, which means that to get energy, they need to consume food uh, or consume other organisms. For this reaction or stage, we're going to be using three things, carbon dioxide, ATP, and reduced NADP. Now, one thing I need to mention is that when you're writing reduced NADP in the exam, do not write it as NADPH um, because sometimes it's not included in the marking scheme. Sometimes you need to be very specific and write reduced NADP. Just be on the safe side. Don't write this H. Write reduced um, NADP. So first of all, what happens is rubulose bisphosphate, also known as RUBP, is combined with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and this reaction the combination of these two is catalyzed by an enzyme called rubisco rubisco is an actual enzyme it is not a coenzyme like nadp this combination produces an unstable six carbon intermediate this process is known as carbon fixation where carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is fixed into the plant this unstable six carbon intermediate is broken down into two products, two glycerate phosphate, GP. This GP is converted to triose phosphate. So like two glycerate phosphate, each GP produces a TP. So two TPs are produced. How is this happening? So ATP that is produced will be used here. So phosphorylation basically happens of the GP. And NADP, reduced NADP, is oxidized to NADP, emitting an, a hydrogen. This hydrogen is taken up by the GP. So GP is basically reduced because it gains a hydrogen. So after this GP gets a phosphate from ATP and gets a hydrogen from NADPH, it becomes a triose phosphate. Now, if you remember, triose phosphate is also produced in uh, glycolysis of anaerobic and aerobic respiration. This triose phosphate can then be used by the plant to produce glucose, to produce amino acids, to produce lipids, and all these things can be, you know, used up by the plant. So lipids can make the um, cell membrane, like phospholipids, 
amino acids can be uh, can be used to produce proteins. Glucose can be used to produce um, glycogen or used in respiration of, of the mitochondria in the mitochondria of the plant. Anyways, we have to know that only only one sixth of triphosphate is converted to something that is actually used by the plant um, or any other product, and five sixths of the triphosphate is used to regenerate um, rubulose bisphosphate or RUBP, and then the cycle continues. That is why it is called Calvin cycle because it is literally a cycle. The cycle repeats, um, and that is how carbon dioxide is used. That is how Hydrogen is split and light is used, glucose and other products are produced, and oxygen is produced as a waste product, and this is how we both are breathing in oxygen right now. So moving on from photosynthesis, um, we have two graphs that you must know, absorbance and action spectra, and these are very important because they pop up in both paper 4 and paper 5. Uh, and this is actually, these are three points from a question which asked what the difference between absorption and action spectra is. So an absorption spectrum is shown right here. It has absorbance on the y-axis and wavelengths in the x-axis. I discussed this in the beginning of the video, but different pigments, different photosystems absorb different wavelengths of light. It absorbs most wavelengths. And then the wavelength that it does not absorb or the light color that it does not absorb is reflected away from the photosystem or from the pigment, which gives the pigment its color. That's why we see green, because green is reflected. So the absorption spectrum here shows how much of each wavelength is absorbed. So usually we have multiple pigments in one graph. So this is chlorophyll B, this is chlorophyll A, and here it is shown what each of these graphs absorbs and then we have the action spectrum which has the rate of photosynthesis on the y-axis um, and it shows the rate of photosynthesis for light wavelengths so different wavelengths will have a different effect on the plant uh, and a different rate of photosynthesis overall and the higher the absorbance of course the higher the rate of photosynthesis because the more light absorbed the more electrons are excited or the faster they're excited and um, you know the rate of photosynthesis basically increases because light dependent reaction increases in rate. We have to quickly brush up on chromatography here so if you have taken IGCSE chemistry then you must have a basic idea on what chromatography is but here in this specific chapter chromatography is used to identify different chloroplast pigments so you can basically crush up a plant leaf so you extract the pigments by crushing up the leaf with solvent and then we can identify using chromatography which uh, pigments are contained in this leaf so after we crush up the leaf with solvent we filter it to obtain solution so of course when you filter with filter funnel and filter paper what comes out is a solution and what is left behind is residue of different tissue and stuff that were not stuff that was not crushed up then you draw a pencil line two centimeters above the base of the chromatography paper so chromatography paper is basically just like normal paper you will draw a two i mean a pencil line two centimeters above the paper base this is very very important has to be about two centimeters above the base. Then we'll use the pipette. Paper. <laughs> we'll use the pipette to pipette out uh, some of that uh, solvent. We'll place small drops along the line. So we'll place the drops like this along the line. We might have to place multiple drops, like on each position, to make the color that appears stronger because it might be a bit faint. Then we'll place the paper in a small amount of solvent, so in a beaker we'll have some solvent. Uh, what is very important is the solvent must not pass this pencil line, it has to be below the pencil line. Measure the solvent, solvent front end distance. So basically after you put it for a bit, 
you will remove it when the solvent, so the solvent here gets kind of absorbed by the paper and it reaches the top here. So once it reaches the top and it is clear, you remove the paper and you'll measure the solvent uh, front. The solvent front is the distance between this line and this line. It's going to be the same for all dots, of course. So you only need to measure it once and then you measure the distance traveled by all spots. So what you'll notice is that the spots will travel at different distances. So you'll find that the, the, the solvent will have the spots the same place, really, because it's the same solvent, same solvent used here. I mean, solution, same solution used here. So all these dots will have identical dots at the same positions, same number of dots. So let's look at this paper instead because this is just, this is a mess. So this is the solvent front you're, you're going to be measuring. And then, say for example, you only did like one drop to make it clear. Um, and you notice there are two drops right here. You're going to be measuring the distance of each of these drops. Then for each drop, you calculate the RF value. So the RF value is basically the distance traveled by that pigment. So it's a pigment divided by the solvent front. So different pigments dra travel at different distances. So this is a different pigment. This might be chlorophyll A. This might be chlorophyll B. I don't know. I'm just giving examples. And then you compare the, the values that you get of the R value with, um, with known values. So maybe you have a paper of some sort um, where you know that chlorophyll A has an R value of a certain value. And then chlorophyll B has a different R value, of course, because it travels a different distance. So you'll compare your results you calculated with this paper to find out what these pigments are. So the basically, if you have an R value of 0.7, and then the paper has 0.7 for chlorophyll A, then you know for sure that this pigment that you measure it for is chlorophyll A. Sometimes you may be asked in paper 4 or 5 uh, to use an indicator like DCPIP to estimate or measure the rate of photosynthesis um, and the effect of a factor on that rate, factor like carbon dioxide or light intensity or temperature. So the way this DCPIP indicator works is that you place it in the, um, you know, the water of an aquatic plant, for example, and then it picks up the electrons, uh, picks up the electrons emitted from the reaction center instead of the electron transport chain. So the DCPIP indicator gets reduced because it gains electrons. This causes the DCPIP to change colors. And then the rate at which it changes the color indicates the rate of photosynthesis. So the way a marking scheme is, so basically they will give you an experiment that you must plan out. So you'll state the independent and dependent, dependent variables and all that other stuff that you must state. And then these points must be included um, for the indicator. So you will time how long it takes to change the color of the indicator and the indicator turns from blue which is oxidized to colorless when it gets reduced or when it gains electrons this is due to electrons from photosynthesis and uh, this is by mistake yeah okay limiting factors are factors required in a prog in a process that are in a short supply and an increase in that factor will cause an increase in the rate of the process. So the limiting factors, this, these are points from the syllabus if you want to read them. So the limiting factors for photosynthesis that you must know from the syllabus are light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, and the temperatures um, that are in the atmosphere, basically. These are limiting factors. Um, and then we will explain the effect of changing these factors on the rate of photosynthesis. So for light intensity, um, when the light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. And this is because more energy is supplied 
more energy is absorbed by accessory pigments, the faster the LDR gets, the dependent reaction, because more electrons get excited or they get excited at a higher rate. So more products are supplied to the Calvin cycle. So the rate of photosynthesis overall increases. For carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide, of course, will cause a higher rate of photosynthesis because more of it is fixated by the Calvin cycle. So more GP produced and more TP and so on. So the rate increases. Temperature, when temperature increases, the rate also increases. Uh, the reason is the Calvin cycle contains enzymes. And if you took chemistry or biology from before, you'd know that increasing the temperature increases the rate of reaction because, and these points are very important, the particles gain more kinetic energy. So there are more enzyme substrate complexes. So they more frequently collide collide more frequently. So more enzyme substrate com complexes are produced per unit time, um, so the rate increases. This mostly affects the, the Calvin cycle because the Calvin cycle contains actual enzymes and NADP is not counted as an actual enzyme, so light dependent reactions like photophosphorylation don't really get affected because they don't have enzymes. You also must know different investigations to determine the effects of factors on the rate of photosynthesis. So as we said, we have three factors here that we must focus on. Um, there are a lot of paper five questions that come based on this. So you must know this very well, and also paper four. Um, so light intensity, we have of course independent and dependent variables. Independent ones are the ones that we change. If we want to investigate the effect of different light intensities on the rate of photosynthesis, that makes the light intensity an independent variable. So we must have at least five independent variables per experiment, so five different light intensities. The way we could do this is by altering the distance of the light source from the lamp. Um, and this gives us different light intensities. Of course, there are also dependent variables or ones that you must control to make the experiment um, to make the experiment um, valid. So one of these things could be the voltage of the lamp. So the voltage of the lamp must stay the same for all of these different distances. And also other factors must stay constant like carbon dioxide concentration and temperature. Now when we look at carbon dioxide as the independent variable, we could use different quantities of sodium hydrogen carbonate in water plants, so aquatic plants. We can use different concentrations or quantities of sodium hydrogen carbonate. This thing basically emits carbon dioxide, so it changes the carbon dioxide concentration of the water. Um, yeah. Then we also keep the other things constant. We have temperature. Uh, if we want to do um, investigation regarding the different temperatures, and the effect of rate of photosynthesis, we'll place the water plant beaker in a thermostatically controlled water bath and we'll change the temperatures and keep them constant, of course, at least five different temperatures. Things you must know if you have an aquatic plant that you want to test um, the effect of factors on, uh, the water plant must the water must be well aerated, which means you have to bubble air into the water of the plant. So this is a plant, for example. <laughs> so you bubble water, bubble air into that water so that um, gases that are in the water don't dissolve with the water and make the experiment invalid. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, please share with other people and subscribe, like, comment, and your support means a ton to me. And have a great day.